Now, last year, we began a journey through Matthew. We started back last January. It's been a fun experiment so far, taking us into some things maybe we wouldn't normally talk about. Uh, it's good, and it's been a good way of going back, also looking at the Old Testament, connecting some of the dots there. Uh, and we made it through chapter 7, and so we're going to pick up this morning here at the beginning of chapter 8. So what has happened so far? Jesus is born, he begins his ministry, he has the temptation, starts ministry, we see him, and it says he's going around and he's preaching the gospel, he's telling people to repent, he's healing everybody. We don't really see what that looks like, we're just told it happens. And then we get this big chunk of teaching where we spent a lot of last year called the Sermon on the Mount. And so we went through that and broke down. He's doing a lot of things in there. He's teaching the gospel. He teaches us He teaches us how to pray. He raises the ethical standard for his followers, and then he ends with some warnings there. And it's this big chunk of teaching that leaves people astonished. Like, they can't believe this guy and how he's teaching and what he's saying, this authority that he has. It's unbelievable. And so... Now he's coming down from the mountain. And the first section that we're going to cover here in the next three weeks, we're calling the untouchables. Because what's going to happen is Jesus is going to start showing some of that authority through action. And he's going to start healing people. But the people he's healing are all a little bit interesting. They're three of the least likely people that Jesus would go to and heal. They're stories that the reader of this and that context would have just been baffled by. Like, wow, he goes, he goes there first. Huh. Really interesting. What's interesting, too, is all three of these individuals would have been excluded from temple worship in their day. And they're the ones that Jesus goes to first. They're the outsiders. They're the untouchables. So this morning's passage is actually pretty short. It's right at the beginning of chapter 8. We're going to start in verse 1. It says this, When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, that's Matthew's word for, like, look, check this out. Something wild's about to happen. He says, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. And so it starts with him coming down from the mountain. Now we just saw Jesus' matchless teaching on the mountain. Now we're going to see his matchless power at work. And so the people who listen to the Sermon on the Mount I mean, they were impressed with his authority just from hearing him speak. And now he's going to start demonstrating that through action. Matthew's going to show us here, this is what that authority looks like. We've heard what it sounds like. Now this is what it looks like. Now he's going to do only the things that he can do. Not only does he have command over the law, but Jesus is going to demonstrate he's got command over the laws of nature itself. It says, at this point, great crowds followed him. So right here, Jesus is real popular. A lot of people into Jesus. Now, it won't stay that way for too long, as you know. And certainly today, now, Jesus is not terribly popular. But at this point, hearing this message for the first time, these people, they eat it up. They're all about it. They are excited. They're buzzing. I wonder if, to some degree, Jesus is sort of seen as he's the new hip thing here, right? Like, people love the new thing. People just love new stuff, period, right? Just like new stuff. Everyone in here, every single one of us, has something that we enjoy that we can just never get enough of. We want new, different, more interesting. Maybe it's new clothes. Maybe it's a new recipe. Maybe it's a new TV show or movie to watch. Maybe it's a new Pokemon to catch. I don't know. I'm not judging. For Adrian and I, it's uh, new board games. We just can't, cannot get enough. I want to play everything. I want to play all of the board games. 
That is why our board game collection has grown probably literally exponentially since we started collecting them a little over a year ago. We got a Visa gift card for Christmas. But it was like 30 bucks and we were like, let's go to the board game store. <laughs> like, it was just done. Heard about this game called Ohm. Pretty cool stuff. This weird German game. And it's great. And so, yeah, we used that right away. And so, but it's always, there's always something new. There's always something new to try. We like novelty, just as people. Like, we're, we're into that. New stuff. We want the new thing. People are also into new ideas, right? There's a lot of people, it's so weird, that people will talk about how they're really spiritual, but they just completely reject any possibility of Jesus in their life. Like, well, I'm, I'm real spiritual. I don't want to get into that Jesus thing. And really, it's like, they're just interested in whatever the new trend is, right? Like, New Age books just fly off the shelf. Like, people eat that junk up. Like, The Secret sold, like, a million copies, even though it's just completely ridiculous. People are like, yes, The Secret, let's do this. They're really interested. And I think it's not so much that they're interested in truth, they're interested in novelty. What's the new idea? What's the new thing? I mean, this month is the month when a lot of people are like, well, I'm going to try some new thing, and they're done by February. It's funny talking to people that are in the gym constantly all year that they're like, I hate January, but <laughs> mid-February it clears out and we're good. <laughs> and so I wonder if Jesus gets a little bit of popularity that way here, that the crowd's following him because, hey, here's this new teacher and he's got these new things to say and he's saying old things in new ways and he's, doing, he's cool and he hasn't done anything too crazy yet, so we're with this guy. And so Jesus, is, he's popular. He comes down from the mountain. Big crowds are following him. They're following him. I think it shows that people are responding to the message here. The gospel's getting through where Jesus is preaching it. People are responding. There's this call to not put your trust in yourself, to own up to your own spiritual poverty. And they're into that. They don't want to trust in themselves anymore. They want to trust in God. And so that's where we're at, that's sort of the setting that Matthew gives. And then he says, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him. Like I said when I read it, whenever Matthew uses that word behold, it's the, hey, watch this, something wild's about to happen. It's almost like he's highlighting the next section for you. And the crazy thing that happens here is that a man with leprosy comes up to Jesus and kneels down before him. Now, Leprosy here isn't necessarily the same skin condition that we know today as leprosy. Uh, it could be any number of skin conditions there. It could be uh, sores, it could be eczema, it could be vitiligo, uh, it could be something like leprosy, it could be gangrene. They didn't really know the difference back then. Just if there was something weird happening on your skin, leprosy. And so this guy's got something. We don't know what it is, but he's got some skin condition. But that's not even the most important part. See, lepers back then were considered unclean. Unclean to both God and to the community. And so there's extensive laws in Leviticus that go through. This is what you do for lepers. This is how you treat them. Different kinds of leprosy, this is what you do about them. I would read some of those to you, but I have a feeling some of us are on the verge of sleep right now anyway, so we won't. Uh, and so they're considered unclean because while some of these skin conditions are contagious, in this quarantine, it helped prevent outbreaks. Not all of the conditions were, and strangely enough, actual leprosy is really not that contagious. But some of the other ones could be. And so they weren't really able to tell the difference. So skin condition, you're a leper, so you get banned. You're unclean. And so by naming them unclean, one of the things that happened is they were banned from all walled cities. So any city that had walls, you couldn't be there if you're a leper. That means that you can't go to Jerusalem as a leper. That means you can't go to the temple as a leper. So you're completely shut off from religious worship back then because you can't get there. So not only are these people kicked out of the city, they're cut off of their relationship from other people. These people are kicked out of the temple. They're cut off with their relationship with God. And so then these lepers are commanded that 
They had to keep their appearance ragged. They had to have their hair disheveled. They had to have their clothes messed up so that you could just look in the distance and see somebody that just looked kind of off and know that's a leper. So you wouldn't get close to that person. They had to walk with their faces low and covered. I'm not even sure what the purpose of that would be, but what it does is it makes the shame of the disease much greater. You can't even look at people. You can't even be seen. As they're walking through, if they were approaching people, they had to yell, unclean, unclean, as they approached people so that those people would know to make room, not get anywhere near them, not touch them, not come into contact with them, have nothing to do with them. And so all of this just chips away at the humanity of these people. They're not allowed to groom and keep up their appearance. I don't know about you, I feel so much better after a haircut, right? I'm just like, yes, haircut, yeah, this is great. My hair starts getting too long and it just kind of naturally grows in white trashy into like this mullet thing back here. And it's like, it, it just kills me. I get it shaved and I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. I feel good about myself. You have that taken away, and man, and even beyond that, man, depression's going to set in a whole lot more easily. That's one of the things they tell depression patients is, hey, still go through your morning routines. Those things will help you. Get up, get dressed, take a shower, groom yourself, because those things will help pull you out. And here, they're denied that as lepers. You specifically can't do that. They're not allowed to look at people. They're not allowed to be seen by people. They have to both be instantly recognizable as being a leper, but not have anything that identifies them as human, right? Like, you can't see their face. Just look at the, this shape that you know you don't want to go near. And then they've got to constantly announce their presence to shoo people away from them. So it's the humanity of these folks. It's just chipped away little by little as they deal with this disease, whichever disease it is that they have. And so the fear of these diseases, it was just completely off the charts. So you don't want to get one of these because it's this terrible thing that happens. And then, if you touched a leper, you were unclean too. And so then you had to go through the process to show yourself clean and purify yourself and so on. The lepers back then were seen as the living dead. They might as well have been yelling dead man walking as they moved around because it was assumed that their lives would end soon and that they'd functionally ended well before. They were sort of Schrodinger's people. They're both dead and alive at the same time. There's a spot in the Old Testament where someone may or may not have been stricken with leprosy and the prayer that's offered up so that they would not be, that they would be cured from that is Lord, don't let them be like someone who is born dead. And so they're sort of this walking dead, walking around. The way they talked back then about curing a leper, one, it was seen as impossible. It was on the same level as raising the dead. Like, how are you going to talk about curing lepers? That's impossible. No one cures lepers. And they didn't talk about being cured of leprosy. They talked about being cleansed from leprosy. That it was this spiritual and physical thing that had taken their lives over. And if someone could come and change that and change your whole situation, they weren't just healing a disease. They were cleansing your whole being. And so with all of this, this makes lepers the most ostracized group of people in Jesus' day, bar none. No one was quite as shunned and dehumanized as lepers were back then. And so then Jesus heals this man. And then after he heals him, he says this interesting thing to him. He says, see that you say nothing to anyone. And so, of course, this is who, like Jesus heals this guy here. But when he does, he says, like, see that you say nothing to anyone. And Jesus tells other people this on a few different occasions, which seems odd, right? Like, Jesus, isn't that the whole point of getting the word out? Why are you trying to tell people to keep a secret here? It doesn't make any sense. Well, what he's doing here, part of what he's doing in this instance, and what I think he's doing in some of those other instances as well, is that he wants to build his following at the right time on the right terms. He doesn't want just anyone and everyone running around talking about, hey, there's this Jesus guy, he's the Messiah, and so on. 
because everyone back then had this idea of who the Messiah was going to be and what he was going to do. And it was thought that what he was going to do was lead a military insurrection against Rome and overthrow the government. And so Jesus is like, pump the brakes. I don't want people getting the wrong idea. That's not the kind of kingdom I'm bringing. So he tells people to keep it secret so that this builds at the right time and in the right way. He doesn't want people to misunderstand what he's here for. So there's a couple lessons I think we can take away from this passage this morning. I want to dive into three things that we can take from these four verses. The first is that Jesus cares about whole people. I think sometimes we get this idea that we can separate our spiritual life out from our physical life or emotional life, and we can't do it. We think that for some reason, well, Jesus is only invested in the spiritual part, and everything else I can sort of close off and compartmentalize away from him. But it's just not true, and this story demonstrates that. If Jesus didn't care about physical health, why does he go around healing so many people? Seems like a weird waste of his time then. It's like, I'm just going to go do this thing that doesn't matter for two or three years, then we'll wrap this up. I know, like he goes around and he heals people because he cares about their health. What's interesting to me is the early church actually used to over-spiritualize some of these stories about Jesus. You read their writings, and they kind of gloss over the fact that he's actually healed people, and they start going into, well, it was the spiritual awakening, and so forth and so on. One commentator points out, sometimes we humans have the tendency to be more spiritual than God. Jesus goes around and he's healing people, and they're like, well, there's got to be something more to it than this. Well, no, I care about people, and I'm trying to heal them. We tend to look for deeper insights, and sometimes God's just pretty straightforward. And so Jesus heals this man of this terrible disease, and that reverberates through the rest of his body. But make no mistake about it, he heals his body, right? God cares about our health, and he takes joy in restoring it to us. Jesus also takes care of this man relationally. So he takes care of him physically. He takes care of him relationally. Because remember all the things I said about leprosy. It's this terrible thing. You're shunned. You're ostracized, all that. Then Jesus tells him, well, go do these things. Show yourself to the priest. Well, why does he say that? Because when the man goes and he gives those offerings and he does those rituals, those things are going to heal him. But it's going to allow him to show himself to the priest. And the priest is going to be able to look at him and go, all right, you're clean. You're good to go. And then he's re-entered back into community. Now he can come back into the city. Now he can go back into the temple. He's able to go back into society this way. And so this is just as important as restoring his physical health. Because Jesus is giving him back his humanity. He's giving him back his connection to other people. We never know anything else about this guy. Who knows what family, what friends he had left behind as a result of this disease. Now, he gets those things back. Jesus restores him, restores his health, he restores his place in society. And that shows us that Jesus cares about these things, and I think it directs us that they should be priorities for us, too. As a church, we can't just focus solely on spiritual needs. We have to help people meet their other needs as well. Sometimes, first. We have to realize that everything is spiritual and everything is connected, and that giving someone food or shelter, that might be the most spiritual thing you do for them. That's why we do some of the things we do here at Lakeside. For example, the wellness groups that I talked about in the announcements. It's a way that the leaders of those groups can help people restore physical health whether those are people from Lakeside, people from the community. Like, the information about those groups goes out everywhere. We want anybody and anybody to come in and be a part of that. And then as followers of Jesus, our physical health has to be important. Because, look, if our physical health suffers, our spiritual health is going to go right along with it. We'll be less effective for the gospel if we can't move or we can't act. We'll be less able to pray or read our Bibles or invest in people if our health keeps us from doing those things. And now I can talk about that with like a tremendous amount of personal experience the past couple of years, right? Like I can tell you all about how your physical health failing you can make it difficult to serve Jesus the way you would like to. And so if you don't have that peace, then that affects the spiritual peace. We run, speaking of peace, financial peace, to help people with financial 
hell. Because look, here's the deal. God calls us to be generous, but we can't give if we have nothing to give. We can't help meet the needs of other people if we have nothing left after we've taken care of ourselves. If we're stressed out constantly because of money, that's going to make it hard to focus on anything else. That's going to wreck your prayer life. That's going to wreck your Bible reading. It's going to do it. And so those classes are one way that we help with that, to help people get back on track in those ways. We do missions projects all over the world. We fund those to help meet physical needs. I talked just a couple weeks ago about an orphanage in the Congo that we part with, partner with, that we paid for some ovens, some kitchen equipment, outfitted them. Why? So that they can make breakfast for the orphans, so that those kids' physical needs are met. We give it to the food pantry right here in Algoma, so the people around here have that need, have their hunger needs taken care of as well. We do that. Why? Because Jesus cares about those needs, and we should care about those needs as well. Jesus cares about the whole person, and we see that here in this story. The second thing is that this leper manages to give us sort of this primer on faith here. There's a lot about faith that we can learn from his story. For one, he teaches us a proper way to bring our requests before the Lord. He starts with worship. How does he start? He comes to Jesus, bows down, and calls him Lord. He recognizes who Jesus is. Prayer begins with worship. It begins with that taking that time to recognize Jesus for all that he is. So he starts with worship, and then he moves to respect. He doesn't demand. He asks, if you will. He puts his trust in Jesus and in his will. Lord, what do you want to do in this situation? You know best. And then lastly, he ends with confidence, right? It's not wishy-washy. He ends with, you can make me clean. He knows what Jesus can do. He's confident in that. This is what faith looks like. It's confidence. It's confidence that Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. And so this teaches us that if we approach Jesus, we can be sure that he will heal us, that he will hear us, and that he wants to help us. He can help us. And now, the leper asked the question, if you will, which I think raises another question, is it always God's will to heal? Now, I grew up in the kind of church that would say yes, absolutely to this, that God always wants to heal, and if you're not healed, then the problem is on your end. It's not on God's end, which sounds good. The problem with that is the Bible. Uh, Let's just take Paul, for instance. Paul's got this thorn in the flesh that he is never healed of. And he is specifically told when he's praying to be healed of it. Now, we don't know exactly what it is. Probably based just on context clues, it's probably something with his eyes. But he's praying, God, remove this thorn from my flesh. And God specifically tells him, no, I'm not going to do that. That's not what I've got for you right now. I need you to carry this. And so it's hard for me to say that God always wants to heal us when the Bible says different. And so then it's not always God's will to heal. Sometimes he won't. And now it might not seem that way at first, but I find this incredibly comforting. Because that means that he's in control. And if we go through something, it's because he wants us to go through it. He still has his hand on us. It's not, I'm going through this thing and it's my fault and I'm spiraling out of control and I've done all of this. It's, no, I'm going through this because he wants me here. For whatever reason, he's taking this bad thing that I'm enduring and he's using it for my good. He's going to work it out for my benefit in some way, shape, or form. That means that we don't go through a single thing because our faith is not strong enough. Now, sure, some of the things that we experience might be the result of our own sin or our own actions. You smoke every day for 30 years, the lung cancer you get is not going to be a mystery where that came from, right? But nothing we go through is punishment for not having enough faith. That totally misunderstands what faith is all about. 
God will not withhold healing from us because we're not doing a good enough job of faithing, whatever that looks like. Here's the thing. It's not the worthiness of our approach to Jesus. It's the worthiness of the Jesus that we approach. Right? It's not the power of our faith in God. It's the power of the God in our faith. He is able, and if we trust that he is able, we have all the faith that we need. Jesus tells the disciples, you can get anything done with just a little teeny, tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny bit of faith. Just the smallest seed I can find, that seed. Just that, a little much, you can't even see it. And so it's true then that like sometimes when we bring our prayers before God with, if you will, he will answer, I will not. Sometimes he'll say I will, sometimes he'll say no. And there could be any number of reasons for that, and I can't begin to look at any one person's situation and give you an exact reason why that is. We may never know the reason for any of our suffering this side of home. But I do know this, we can always know his motives. We may not know his reasons, but we always know his motives, is that he's working everything out for our good. Those who love him, he's ensuring that everything happens with our best interest in mind. Sometimes we have to go through difficult things to come out better on the other side. My shoulder is probably a better example than my head surgery, because that one hasn't worked. But <laughs> So let's use this one. What did they do when they repaired my shoulder? Well, they cut me open. They cut my tendons off, they drilled into the bone, they did all kinds of whack, they're just gluing me back together in there, just putting screws in, who knows what. Now, I was in a fair amount of pain after I had to stop the medication. This is not fun, it was hard to do things for myself, it was super frustrating, had to do physical therapy for a while, that's never fun. We just kind of confined to a couch and to bed for a little bit. Spent the entire summer not being able to do anything. But now, the damage in that joint is gone. I can lay on my right side again. Like I can, I've got my range of motion almost back, doing pretty good there. Strength, not quite, because I don't ever feel like working out with my migraines. But, you know, it'll, we'll get there. But I can throw, I can swing a tennis racket. Like I can do pretty much anything I want to with this shoulder. I had to go through this whole surgery to come out healthier on the other side. If you just, if someone just came up to you and did the things that they did to me, like, ah, this guy just attacked me and he cut me open and cut my tendon off and drilled it in the bone. You'd be like, that's a terrible thing. That's awful. But in this context, I had to go through it, all of this pain, all of this damage to my physical health to improve my physical health. Sometimes we have to go through hardship to get to something better on the other side. And so we can be sure that if we go through hardship, God is using that to produce something in us on the other end, whatever that may be. And so we can trust him as a result. And that's ultimately what faith is, is it's trust in him. It's trust that Jesus can do what he said he could do. It's trust that nothing is too difficult for him. And it's trust that whether he chooses to act or chooses not to act in our situation, it's with nothing but our best interest in mind. Last lesson here is the most fascinating to me. Think about this leper situation, right? It had been maybe years since this man had been touched by anyone that did not also share his disease. Maybe not by anyone at all. And if Jesus stands back at a distance and speaks healing to this guy, this is a very different miracle. And according to Matthew, what's interesting is it's the words that do the healing anyway. It's when he says, I will be clean, that immediately the guy is clean. But Jesus doesn't just stand back and speak words to this man. He reaches out and touches him. Jesus is a God that touches lepers. He's not afraid of his mess. Nobody wants to touch a leper. The ironic truth is that actual leprosy, not that contagious. You'd probably be okay. You're not going to get it by touching someone that has it. But they didn't know that. 
They just saw this ghastly disease and didn't want to go anywhere near it. I couldn't help but sort of think about the way that people used to think about like HIV, like back when Magic Johnson and all that, and there was all this hysteria and you didn't want to even touch somebody that, and now we know a lot different, we know exactly how it's transmitted, we know, it's sort of the same kind of pariah situation that we don't even want to touch these people, we don't even go near them. And Jesus reaches out and touches this guy. And he does it because he wants to. It wasn't necessary for Jesus to touch this guy. He could have very easily just stood back, said, be clean, and the man would have been clean. There are plenty of other miracles that we'll talk about as we go through Matthew where Jesus just says words and things happen. But he chooses to reach out and touch this guy. There is nothing too messy that Jesus can't reach into. There is nothing that could keep him away. There is nothing that keeps Jesus at bay where he goes, "Mm, I'm just going to stay back here and and we'll deal with this from a distance. There is no sin too big. There is no life too messy. There is no problem too ugly. Nothing stops Jesus from touching those who kneel before him. And Jesus isn't afraid of breaking the rules here either, right? Because the ceremonial law says, you touch a leper, you're unclean now too. That doesn't bother Jesus. It's like, I don't care. I'm just going to touch this guy. You do what you want to do. Call me whatever you want. I'm touching this leper. See, Jesus knows something that they didn't know. As it's not our outward condition that makes us unclean. It's what's inside. It's what's in our hearts, in the very center of our being, in our core, our emotions, our thoughts, our minds, the things other people can't see, the things we could get away with, everything that's going on on there, that is what makes us unclean. And so we get these two great models in this account from Matthew. Jesus models for us a way to live. Care about whole people. Don't just limit your care to people's spiritual needs. Care about whole people. Feed hungry people before you give them the gospel. Put a roof over their head. Put a Bible in their hand before you put a Bible and their hand. It's a call to the church, and it's a call to all of us as disciples of Jesus. And Jesus teaches, don't be afraid to touch the lepers. Get your hands dirty. Don't be afraid of the mess. Get uncomfortable. Get a little unclean. Don't be worried about what other people are going to say, what they're going to think. Reach out and touch the lepers. And this now former leper, he teaches us, about faith in an excellent way. That we can trust that Jesus can do anything. Nothing is too big for him. Nothing is impossible. He can do whatever he wants. And that we, if we trust that, that's what it means to have faith in him. And then lastly, that we can approach him confidently, open to his will, to trust that he is in control. Whatever you want, Lord, you're in control. You know what's best, and you will only give your children good gifts. And so we can bring our prayers to him and ask for what we need. And I think ask him to give us the things that we would ask for if we knew what he knew. And then as we ask to be open to whatever his will is and trust that what he has for us is ultimately what he wants, and what we would want as well. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we serve a God who touches lepers. And that if we come to you and we bring our faith, our trust, and our worship to you, that nothing else about us will keep you from reaching out and touching us. Lord, I pray as we begin this new year that we would be just encouraged that you would give us the strength and uh, 
the knowledge, the ideas to begin good habits for all of our areas of health, that we would see such a benefit to our spiritual health as we give our whole lives over to you. We trust you with everything. And that like this leper, as we bring our faith, our worship to you, that you would reach out and touch us, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.